Sometimes, the punishment does not seem to fit the crime. And at first glance, Moses striking a rock in the desert out of frustration with the Israelites does not appear to be a just reason for him to forego seeing the promised land. After all, he'd seen the 10 plagues led Israel out of Egypt and across the Red Sea, delivered the 10 commandments from Mount Sinai and won many of Israel's battles. So why would God allow a single rock strike in Meribah to keep Moses from entering the land that God had promised Israel. Psalm 106.32, New King James Version. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses on account of them. Moses was the Israelites' leader. He witnessed more miracles than Isaac and Jacob combined. The majority of the miracles are obvious manipulations of nature, as God demonstrates his power over all that he has created for the benefit of his people. Let us look at the location of Meribah, what happened there, and why Moses' actions at Meribah prevented him from making it all the way to Jericho. Where is Meribah in the Bible? Meribah, or Masa, appears in two places in the Bible. In fact, the Israelites travel through two Meribah locations, Meribah and Meribah Kadash, but a similar thing occurs at both locations. The water miracle. Meribah means strife or contention, which seems to fit the bill based on how the Israelites acted prior to the water miracle. One of the Meribah locations is described in scripture as being in the desert of sin, the literal name of the desert, though the English connotations are not lost on readers. We don't know where it was, but we do know it was in the wilderness before the Israelites arrived in the promised land. That is something to keep in mind for the future. The Israelites had become so disoriented in the wilderness that they had lost sight of the important journey ahead of them, as did Moses' frustration with them, which eventually drove him away from the Promised Land. Meribah also appears in the end times. Another area Meribah is literally cited in the Word of God is in the book of Ezekiel. In the coming allotment of the land of Israel in the Millennial Kingdom, Meribah Kadesh will serve as a border for the section allotted to the tribe of Gad. Ezekiel 47.19, New King James Version. The south side toward the south shall be from Tamar to the waters of Meribah by Kadesh, along the brook to the great sea. This is the south side toward the south. Meribah served to remind the Israelites who followed Moses of their lack of faith in the Lord, and it will do so again during Christ's millennial reign. What happened in Meribah the first time? These passages will feel similar. However, it's important to see the subtle distinctions between the two and how the second one had far greater consequences. The first occurrence happens in Exodus 17. The Israelites complain to Moses about their lack of water. They also put the Lord to the test, hence the tempted above. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also, take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. Exodus 17, 1-6 Water flows from the rocks, providing a drink for the Israelites. In essence, the Israelites approached Moses with a problem. Moses went up to God. God gave Moses specific instructions. As Moses followed, water began to flow. Consider what happens at the second Meribah when Moses becomes frustrated and disobeys God. What happened in Meribah the second time? Numbers 20 contains the second miracle. The Israelites arrive in the Zin Desert near Kadesh. The Israelites again complain to Moses about a lack of water. 
They even argue that Moses should never have taken them out of Egypt. After all, Egypt had pomegranates and figs. When they got thirsty, they forgot about their woes from 400 years of slavery. Moses and Aaron discuss the next steps with God. God's instructions are unambiguous. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus, you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. Numbers 20, 1 through 8. Moses, on the other hand, strikes the rock. Despite continuing to provide water for the Israelites, God is enraged by Moses' disobedience. Moses' rebellious actions, ironically, just before striking the rock rebelliously, he called Israelites rebels, ensure his death in the wilderness rather than the promised land. Why did Moses disobey God? The passage does not literally state Moses had grown tired of how much the Israelites complained, and they complained a lot, so he decided to strike the rock rather than speak to it. However, in essence, this was the case. Moses had grown tired of God's people. They contested him, contested God, and contested Moses' administration at every bend. When Moses went to get the Ten Commandments, he had to put down rebellions and literally overturn idols. He'd had enough. Exodus 32, 1-10 through 10. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So, all the people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation, and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf, and worshipped it, and sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, and my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Does the punishment fit the bill? At first glance, it appears that God is punishing Moses severely. After all, Moses had faithfully followed God's instructions up to this point. Couldn't God just let go? Did he go too far? First, we must understand that the first striking of the rock foreshadows Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5, New King James Version. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Moses obeyed God by striking the rock in Exodus 17, 
But Moses disobeyed God by striking the rock rather than speaking to it in Numbers 20. The incident in Numbers 20 was Moses' second strike on the rock, the first being in Exodus 17. As a result, we teach that Moses was punished for striking the rock twice, rather than striking it twice in Numbers 20. According to 1 Corinthians, God intended the rock in the desert to be a representation of his son, Jesus Christ. In Exodus 17, the Lord told Moses to strike the rock in order to establish a picture of Christ as our Redeemer. Christ is our rock and cornerstone who has been struck for our sake, and he will bring forth streams of living water. As stated repeatedly in Psalms and Isaiah, John 4.10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Furthermore, the book of Hebrews states that Christ died once and for all, and that no further atonement for sins is required. So, in the Exodus 17 scene, the Lord intended Moses to strike the rock in the desert only once, symbolizing Jesus being sacrificed only once to bring us salvation. Later, in Numbers 20, the Lord instructed Moses to only speak to the rock so that the image created in Exodus 17 could be preserved. When Moses chose to strike the rock a second time, he threw a wrench into the Exodus 17 picture. We would have been perplexed by the distorted picture if God had not corrected Moses' error, concluding that Christ, the rock, had to be sacrificed repeatedly for our salvation. As a result, God chastised Moses to ensure that we correctly understood the image of the rock preventing Moses from entering the promised land. During the process, the Lord created a new image to help people understand salvation correctly. By refusing to let Moses enter the promised land, the Lord demonstrated that we cannot enter salvation, meaning the promised land, through the works of the law, meaning Moses, but only through the work of Jesus, that means by Joshua, which is the name Yeshua or Jesus. Second, whenever we question God's punishments in the Bible or in our own lives, we lose sight of the seriousness of sin. Sin essentially tells God that we do not believe he is worthy of being on the throne of our lives. Sin paralyzes, consumes us from within, corrupts, ruins, destroys, and ravishes. Any sin can keep us from entering the promised land. Not only does Moses directly disobey God's orders, but if we look closely at the passage, we can see that he also takes credit for God's actions. Numbers 20, 9 through 10, New King James Version. So, Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Take note of the we. Moses had effectively claimed credit for God's actions. As we see throughout the Bible, things never end well. The Lord kept his promise to provide water. But he told Aaron and Moses that they would not be able to enter the promised land because of their refusal to obey him. Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hallowed among them. Numbers 20, 11 through 13. The rest of the Bible makes it clear that God tested the Israelites at Meribah Kadesh, including Aaron and Moses, to determine their obedience and faithfulness. Psalm 81, 7, New King James Version. You called in trouble, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Selah. The Selah, after these words, marks a pause for the people, addressed to reflect on the numerous mercies bestowed upon them in Egypt, the wilderness, and elsewhere. Psalm 106.32, New King James Version. They angered him, also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses on account of them. Meribah demonstrates that God continues to provide even when we disobey him. He had every right not to provide water from the rock when Moses struck it, but he chose to meet the Israelites' needs anyway. However, the passage also demonstrates that sin has far more deadly consequences than we may anticipate. 
When someone makes us angry, we must be careful not to sin while we are angry or the consequences could be disastrous. Meribah deserves to be remembered as a place of strife and testing. Do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massah in the wilderness. Psalm 95.8 warns, Hebrews 3.4 New King James Version, For every house is built by someone, but he who builds all things is God. The Israelites' unbelief at Kadesh Barnea prevented them from entering the Promised Land for another generation, and Aaron and Moses' disobedience at Meribah Kadesh also prevented them from entering the Promised Land. Disobedience and unbelief have long-term consequences that can affect one's entire life. In Numbers 20, we learned an invaluable lesson about leadership at the expense of Moses. Moses had grown tired of the people's complaining, stagnation, and lack of progress by this point. He was running on fumes, and in his frail state, he made a decision that cost him his future. When God instructed him to speak to a rock in order to obtain water for the nation, he struck it in rage. He reacted in rage rather than with poise, and as a result, he was barred from entering the promised land. This tragic occurrence teaches us at least two lessons. To begin, never make a major decision when you are emotionally depressed. Make decisions during peak times, not during valley times. Also, choose to be proactive in your leadership rather than reactive. Don't let the groans of the crowd dictate your mandate. Take your cues from God and the mission He has assigned to you. Consider the following questions. Number one, am I a reactor or a creator when I lead? Number two, do I play defense or offense when I lead? Number three, am I a people pleaser or a God pleaser when I lead? Number four, do I boss my calendar or does someone else choose where I give my time?